All right, so we're going to be continuing on here with the, the series that we started a few weeks ago um, from Proverbs chapter 6. You don't have to turn it, I'll just read it for you. It's six things that God hates. We're going through that list in Proverbs chapter 6. I'll read it for you. The Bible says, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, even seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. So we've gone through all three of those already the past few weeks. Verse 18 says, "...an heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren." So tonight we're going to be focusing in on that next one, the fourth one there, "...an heart that deviseth wicked imaginations." It's one of the things that God hates. God hates hearts that come up with wicked things, the, the, the imaginations that come. And I, you know, I like how God uses a word, imaginations, with, it's tied in with your heart. When you think of an imagination, you think of your head, right? You think of things that you think about. And all throughout the Bible, you'll notice this, that basically when the Bible's referring to your heart, it is talking about the things that come out of your thoughts, right? You know, when, when it's talking about the, what's in your heart, it, it ultimately is just tied in with what things that you're thinking about. Those are, you know, the, the heart and the mind are, are kind of one when you think of, of what's coming out of them. Obviously, we know that your heart physically is just an organ that's pumping blood and your, your mind is just a brain that's controlling things. But like, the, you know, the, the, the heart, we think of more the mind, but it says here that it's a heart that divides wicked imaginations, so wicked thoughts, wicked ideas, the things that you come up with, wicked out of your heart. God hates that. Now, our first example here, and the first time we see this, and we could see a good example of how much God hates the wicked imaginations out of man's heart, comes here in Genesis chapter 6, where we started reading. Look at verse number 5. The Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And there, and there again we see the imagination of the thoughts of his heart, right? So your, your heart is having thoughts. Well, obviously your heart, again, it's, it's pumping blood, but this, we, get, we get the idea. It's very explicit language. It's not hard to understand what it's talking about here. The imagination of the thoughts of his heart it was only evil continually. So this is in the days before the flood. After God had created man, and they were living on the earth for a while, and after Cain slew Abel, and um, you know, men began to, to be kind of wicked in the earth. And of course, we see in Genesis chapter 6, the source of, of a very weird false doctrine that's out there where it talks about, uh, you know, it says in the beginning there were giants in the earth in those days, and, at, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, People actually think that like angels or demons came in and had intercourse with human wives and produced this hybrid offspring and all this other nonsense. It's just bizarre. It's a weird doctrine. It's something that someone has to literally tell you in order for you to walk away, coming away thinking that. And they say, that's what the giants were. They were these weird offspring and stuff. If you just read the Bible very plainly, it says that there were giants in the earth in those days. Verse number four. And also after that. After what? After there were giants in the earth in those days. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, they became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. So they became famous people. All throughout the Bible, when you see the word, what the phrase sons of God, it's referring to believers. Right. That's it. It's, it's not very complicated. I preach an entire sermon on this subject, on the sons of God. It's very plain. You, you just go through all the places the Scripture talks about it. It's not that difficult. Yet people want to have their Star Trek fantasy land of you know, aliens and demons and mixing with humans and doing all this weird stuff. It's not scriptural. The Bible says that the angels are, not, are neither given in marriage. They don't marry, neither are given in marriage. That, that, that's the way that we're going to be in heaven. When Jesus Christ likened us to the angels, and that's what the angels are like. Yet somehow, people believe that angels married humans and created some kind of giant offspring. It's nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to even go any further than that except to say here, when we see in verse number 5, it says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. He didn't say the wickedness of angels. He didn't say the wickedness of, of giants. It's just the wickedness of man was great in the earth. That, that Ultimately, 
God was displeased with man so much that it, says it, was, it repented him that he even made him. God was just so, he's just like, I'm sorry I even created man. Because they turned out to be a big disaster. They turned out to just have all these wicked imaginations and do an evil upon one another and just made a big mess out of everything. Right? God creates this perfect place. He creates Eden. He creates all this stuff. And he gives man the ability to choose what he wants to do. And you say, here you go. Here's what I'm telling you to do and not do. And, and I've done everything for you. Here you go. It's a perfect place to live. And of course, Adam screws that up. But then from there... It just gets worse and worse and worse. And you got Cain killing his brother Abel and, and on and on to the point to where God just says, you know what, I'm just going to start all over again. And to the point where he brings a flood to wipe out the whole world at that time. That's pretty severe. I mean, that's, that's a lot of, of anger from God to just be like, they're all going to die. And I'm just going to save Noah and his family alive. And we're just going to start from scratch again. And of course, he institutes new laws and on and on. I'm not going to preach that whole sermon, but the sermon tonight is about the imagination of man's heart being wicked, those wicked imaginations. And we see here in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So people were just continually having these evil, wicked thoughts and harming other people. Now flip, if you would, to Genesis chapter 8 real quick. We see after the flood, in verse 21, right near the end of the chapter there in chapter 8, verse 21, the Bible reads, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. So now we see here that you know, we've inherited a sin nature is what this is referring to. The imagination of man's heart, it's evil from his youth. You know, start off with an evil heart. Now, turn if you would to Jeremiah chapter 9. You're in Genesis 8. Turn if you would to Jeremiah chapter 9. And this is going to come into play. I'm going to get into it a little bit um, shortly, but about people who will tell you to trust your heart and just do what your heart says. This sermon is going to completely debunk that wicked philosophy. What you're going to start seeing is that the Bible doesn't really have many good things to say about man's heart. Man's heart is wicked. If you just follow your heart, you're going to get yourself in trouble. We need to be able to determine what's right from God's word and use that as our metric, as our meter of what we're going to say is right and what's wrong. Instead of just how we feel about things or whatever just comes into our heart or comes into our mind. Well, I think this is right. Well, I think that's right. No, we're not capable of doing that because our heart is wicked. Gen uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, we're going to see God pronounce his judgment upon those that walk after the imagination of their heart. The people who just want to do whatever is in their own heart. And it'll be another illustration of God's hatred for it. Look at verse 13 of Jeremiah chapter 9. By the reason the Lord saith, Because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, neither walked therein, but have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood, and give them water of gall to drink. I will scatter them also among the heathen, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send a sword after them till I have consumed them. Basically, God said, I'm going to send destruction on them. Why? First, it says, they've forsaken my law. And then it says they have walked after the imagination of their own heart. So them walking after the imagination of their own heart was contrary to God's law. It was not lining up with what God's law said. And he says, that's why I'm going to destroy them. Because they're doing all these things and just following their own hearts. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, an, an unknown uh, portion of Scripture to, to many people these days, but not in this church. Very popular, very, very well known. Um, we see, of course, the, the downward spiral that, that people can be on um, getting into their, their own vain imaginations. We're we'll see here, look at verse number 21. 
or we'll, we'll start reading a little bit earlier. Verse 19, this is a downward spiral of someone who becomes reprobate, someone who God rejects because they have rejected God. Verse 19 reads, because that, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Basically, God just explaining here that, you know, you could understand about God just through his creation. You're without excuse to just be a fool just claiming that there is no God. There's plenty of evidence to show you that God exists. He says there's, you know, the, that the, the creation, which is us and the world around us, it's clearly seen and being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So that they're without excuse. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So this is talking about people who, they knew God. They had heard the gospel, they heard about God, they knew who God was. But they chose to glorify Him not as God. They said, yeah, I know about God, I've heard about God, and I want to have nothing to do, I'm not going to glorify Him as God. That's not God. That's not the God that I worship. And they became vain in their own imaginations. They decided, well, that's the real God. I don't I want to believe in the real God. Real God's angry, he's mean, he's, he's hateful, whatever. I'm going to make up my own God. And they just become vain in their imaginations. And before you know it, it says here um, in verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So they decide to say, yeah, I know who God is, but you know what? I don't like that, so I'm going to create my own. And they come up with these idols. And they say, this is God. And they, they carve an image of an animal or of a man or of a bird or whatever. And they say, this is my God. And I can make my God however I want, whatever comes out of my wicked heart. And because people do that, of course, verse 24 says, wherefore, meaning because of this, because they knew God, because they glorified him not as God, because they became vain in their imaginations, they created their own idols, they created their own gods. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie. They changed the truth of God. See, they knew the truth of God, but they changed it. They said, yeah, I don't like that. I'm going to come up with my own truth. And they made it into a lie because anything that's not of the truth is a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And on and on and on. It goes on to tell us more of the verses and the attributes and how God views people who have rejected him when they knew the truth but decided not to believe it. They walked after the imagination of their own heart. So walking after the imagination of your own heart can be dangerous and God hates it. God hates it so much he's willing to say, I'm done with you. So we see God destroyed the world over people that walked after the imagination of their own heart in Genesis. We see a man's heart's evil. <clears throat> and we see here that the, the reprobate has become vain in their imaginations before God has given them over to a reprobate mind. And I also think when I think about the, you know, them becoming vain in their imaginations, it's the same people that will tell you, you know, oh, nothing exploded and now we're all here. And, you know, just completely denying the creator. It's, it's nonsense. Turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. It's probably going to be a little bit shorter sermon tonight, but that's all right. You know, I always say that and then it's like, you know, I preach for like an hour or something. So I always hesitate to say something like that. But it's a pretty simple concept. There's definitely some scriptures here that, that talk about our hearts and the wicked imaginations that come out of our hearts. But um, it, it's basically a pretty straightforward concept. We're going to look at Jeremiah 23. Here in this portion of Scripture, we're going to start reading in verse 14. The Bible is giving us a warning and talking about false prophets. And these are the people that have no problem telling their followers, oh, just follow what's in your heart. Now you hear that today, even from pastors and teachers. You'll hear people to say, Oh, just do whatever your heart says, you know, wherever your heart leads you, that that's what you're supposed to do. You hear that in the world, of course, that's not a big surprise. But the problem is when it comes into the pulpit. And when you got supposedly who's a, someone who's supposed to be a man of God saying, Thus saith the Lord, and just telling you to follow your heart and do what your heart says, 
That is not right. We're going to see that spelled out here in Jeremiah 23. Look at verse number 14. We're we'll start reading in verse 14. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. So right off the bat, he's saying, look, these prophets, they're committing adultery. They're walking in lies. They're doing all these things they ought not to do. But not only that, they're strengthening the hands of the, instead of rebuking the evildoers, they're strengthening their hands. They're lifting them up. They're promoting them and basically saying they're not doing anything wrong. They're allowing them to continue in their evil ways as opposed to calling them out and rebuking them. It says that none doth return from his wickedness. And that's the whole point of, it, of the hard preaching is to rebuke the wickedness and the sin and the evil doings so that people stop doing them. So you realize, oh, that's wrong. Oh, these people aren't going to stand for that. And they get people to change their ways. But you say, nope, when you strengthen the evildoers and you say, oh, everything's fine. Just keep doing what's in your heart. We'll say, well, it's in my heart to lust after women. It's in my heart to do that. Well, just keep doing whatever's after your heart. The preacher that says that is strengthening the hands of the evildoers. It says here, they are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. And we know what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah. So we're saying these false prophets are just like unto Sodom and Gomorrah unto me. That's not a favorable description for them. Look at verse 15. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Watch out for the false prophet. Watch out for the people who, especially the ones that don't open the Bible, that aren't preaching to you God's word. You notice how many times we're flipping the different passages in the Bible and we're reading through and getting a lot of context and just reading through the verses and they're being preached on exactly what the verses are saying. That's because I'm trying to preach what God said. It doesn't matter what my opinion is on any of these matters. What matters is what the word of the Lord says because that's what the truth is. But there's a lot of preachers out there that'll just want to tell you the things that tickle your ears. That sound real nice. Oh yeah, I want, I want to hear more about that. Tell me about that. And it's just speaking out of his own heart. Not using scripture to back up and to prove the reason why they're saying what they're saying. Or just pulling one little verse out and talking for an hour. I've had my fair share of churches like that. Look, the Bible's saying, don't listen to the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you that speak a vision of their own heart. We're just making stuff up. That's not what God... See, they'll tell you that God said it. You know, it's a big thing. Oh, I got a word from the Lord. And God said He wants me to tell you this and to tell you that. Liar. If it does, if it's not, definitely, if it's not matching up with the Scripture, if you can't find that in the Bible, liar. Don't say God said something if He didn't say it. But people make it sound good. You know, it's a lot harder also to refute somebody when they say, well, God told me to do this. We say, well, no, he didn't. How could you prove that? Right? Well, yes, he did. I heard it. You know, and, that, and people just like to have that testimony. And it's, it's like talking to a Mormon. And there's Baptists out there and people who, who claim to be Baptists that'll say, oh, God told me, God sent me out to do this and God ordained me and God sent me, you know. And it's really just what comes out of their heart. It's a feeling that they have. Just like the Mormons, when I talk to the Mormons, they say, well, how do you know that, that what, this is true? They ask me that. That's, that's, well, how do you know that what you're believing is right? Um, because it's the Word of God, because it's in the Bible. Oh, well, see, when I was seeking, I prayed to God because God promises that He'll show you what's right. And I prayed, is Mormon the right, Mormon is the right religion? Is this true? And I felt this warm burning in my heart. And I just knew because God confirmed it. That's their testimony. And that's what they'll tell you. Now, how do you argue with that? When someone just has some weird experience and they claim to have some burning in their bosom and some, you know, and I just knew it's true. They're not basing what they believe on any fact. They're basing it on emotion. We need to be able to go back always to God's word. You're going to get in trouble if you're going to make all of your decisions based on emotion. Your emotions are what comes out of your heart. 
Now, sometimes they may be right, but sometimes they may be wrong. We need to be able to rely on the Word of God to get our truth and our source of authority. This is where everything that we believe in should come from. So if you're going to ask me, why do I believe something? It's not because I heard a voice. It's not because I had some weird feeling. It's not because whatever. You know, I could look at some sign and I was driving this way and then this tree fell down in my way and then I had, you know, look, I'm going to rely on the Word of God. Even Peter said that we have a more sure word of prophecy in the Bible. And he was referring to when he saw Jesus Christ transfigured before his own eyes. He saw Jesus Christ in the Mount of Transfiguration, him and John, and they saw Jesus Christ speaking with Moses and Elias. And he says that, you know, I saw this, yet I have a more sure word in Scripture, in the Bible, in the things that have already been written down by men of God. <coughs> That is more solid proof than what he saw with his own eyes. And we need to take that the same way, that whatever the Bible says. Now, look, you may have some experiences in your life where you feel like God was leading you or whatever. I'm not going to stand up and say that God didn't lead you. But what I am going to say is that if anything contradicts what's written in this word, that wasn't God. It wasn't God. And the preachers, you can judge by their fruits. These men that will stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. And that's what the Bible says in Matthew 7, By their fruits you shall know them, talking about the false prophets, talking about the wolves in sheep's clothing, the ones that come in to destroy. <coughs> Look at what they're doing for God. Look at their converts. Talk to them. Do they know the Bible? Are they really saved? you gotta, you got to suppose a man of God... And they supposedly have all these converts and you start talking to them and none of them is saved? An evil tree can't bring forth good fruit. Neither can a good tree bring forth corrupt fruit. And that's how you're going to know the prophets. Also, you just compare the things that they say. Are they preaching out of their own hearts? And you know what? You ought to be examining me every single service. Are the things that Pastor Burzen saying, are they coming just out of his own heart? Or are they actually found in the Bible? Because this is what matters. And if I say something on my own heart, don't listen to it. There's no authority there. The authority comes from God's Word. But here we're going to keep on reading about these, these false prophets that speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Verse 17, They say still unto them that despise me, <coughs> The Lord hath said, You shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. So they tell the people that despise God. They're talking to people that hate God. The Lord hath said, you shall have peace. To people that hate God, he's saying, well, God said that you're going to have peace. The complete opposite of what God said. They're just saying, well, it sounds good, right? I mean, people like to hear, oh, I'm going to have peace. Oh, great, I'll come back next week. I'll throw some more money in the plate. That's what the false prophet cares about. And they'll say to everyone, that, oh yeah, follow your own heart. No evil is going to come. God wants you to follow your heart. That's what the false prophet says. Verse 18, for, for who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. <coughs> The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days ye shall consider it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. The people that God sends are the ones that are going to preach the sermons that will get you to turn from your evil ways. That's how you know who God sent. He's saying, you know, these other people are saying, yeah, just do whatever's in your heart. God didn't say that. that they didn't come from God. He says, I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. So watch out for people who want to claim the name of Christ. Just because someone claims the name of Christ doesn't mean that they're saved or a good guy or, or a, a prophet of the Lord. <clears throat> you could claim all day long all kinds of things, but this world is full of liars and deceivers. <clears throat> Flip to 
look back, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17. Anyone have a cough drop? A chance, anybody? No? All right, I'll just have to suffer then. Jeremiah chapter 17. We're going to go through quite a bit of, of scripture here about the heart and what the Bible says about the heart. You were in Jeremiah 23, if you flip back to chapter 17, look at verse number 9 of Jeremiah chapter 17. The Bible says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. That's a great verse to remember when you, when you hear these people and the, the self-help people and the people who want to help you without God tell you to follow your heart, or when you listen to the mainstream music that talks about following your heart and doing what's in your heart and all these great things coming out of your heart, the Bible says the heart is deceitful. It's going to trick you above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. <coughs> Not going but well for the heart that comes out of man. Flip back if you would to Proverbs, Proverbs 18. There's quite a few passages in Proverbs. <coughs> Proverbs 18, I love this passage in uh, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Proverbs 18 says, Through desire a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. And isn't that the... I've heard this, I don't know how many times, the people saying, oh... I just, I just need to go out and, and find out what my, you know, what's in my heart, what my heart wants. Do whatever your heart wants. And, and I need to go find myself and discover myself and whatever the, are, the, are the desires of my own heart. The Bible says that's a foolish person. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Instead of trying to teach and train your heart what's right and what's not right, just let your heart discover itself. But it says, through desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. So you separate yourself from the wickedness and you seek and intermeddle with all wisdom, but the fool is going to let his heart discover itself. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28, verse 26. The Bible reads, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. If you are basing your decisions and just trusting on what your heart says, the Bible calls you a fool. Plain and simple. Now look, I know our heart can be powerful, but the Bible says it's wicked and deceitful above all things. Don't just do what's in your heart because it feels right. Don't forget that we are still in the flesh. You know, there's a lot of sins that may feel good. It may feel good to commit fornication. It may feel good to get drunk or to get high. Hey, that might feel good unto you, but does that make it right? Absolutely not. It's wicked, and there's all kinds of wicked sins that might feel right, and there's all kinds of decisions that you might want to make that feel a certain way in your heart. But you can't just go based on what your heart is saying. We need to be careful to watch out for the deceitfulness of our own hearts and not just to trust our own heart because the Bible says that's a fool. You know, a lot of times, and, and you know, maybe those of you who are unmarried and, and might end up looking for a spouse one day, you may have strong feelings towards another person. You may be you know, interested in, in, in a young man or a young woman, depending on your gender, um, and you feel very attracted to somebody. But you know in your head, hey, this person's not a Christian. Hey, this person doesn't have the same values as me. Hey, there's all these red flags that are popping up that this isn't going to be a good fit. This isn't going to be a good match. But in your heart, you just feel, oh, but I just love this person so much. Don't let your heart deceive you into making a bad decision. Amen. When you're going to get married, you're getting married to someone for the rest of your life. That's the vow that you make. You're saying until death do us part. 
We're saying, we're, I'm going to stick with you forever. So make sure in advance that you are going through the things that matter and using your head and not just your, hey, if your heart's there, great. I think you should have both. I mean, obviously you should have a feeling of love towards somebody. That should definitely be there. But don't let your heart overrule what your mind is telling you and the things that you've learned and the things that you should be looking for. If you're looking for a virtuous woman, if you're looking for a righteous man or a man of God, if you're looking for these things, keep them in your heart and realize that and have the attraction. Absolutely. You need that in your marriage. But it's not just about that. It's not just about that warm, gushy feeling you get in your heart. You need to be able to use your mind to make the, the best decisions on what's right and what God wants for your life and understanding what the will of the Lord is for you. Flip back, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 19. <clears throat> Don't be fooled by your heart. You have to make sure that whatever it is that's coming out of your heart is lining up with Scripture. Proverbs 19, verse number 20, the Bible reads, Hear counsel and receive instruction, that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. God's words, the counsel from the Lord, that stand, that's eternal, that's a rock. And we can trust on that. He says, there are many devices that come out of your heart. There's all kinds of things that can come out of your heart. Some good, some bad. You know, the Bible talks about man's heart being wicked. Don't rely on that. Get the counsel of the Lord and use that to, to base your decisions on. Now, <coughs> turn, if you would, to Psalm 62. There's a, there's a bunch of verses I'm going to kind of continue going through. I'm going to read for you from 1 Chronicles chapter 22. 1 Chronicles 22, 19 says, Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise therefore and build you the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built to the name of the Lord. And, and this is a commandment for God saying, set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. We need to make sure we set our heart right. Instead of just listening to whatever our heart says, let's train our hearts to set our heart right. And so that to train, you know, you think about your heart, it's, it's, your, it's not just a feeling, but it's also the imagination, the things that you're thinking of. It's train your heart, train yourself to be seeking God and to be doing what's right and to always be trained to, do, to looking to God's word for what we're going, you know, for what you're going to use to lead you. Amen. And setting your heart right and, and, and making it go the right way. Uh, Psalm 62, verse number 10. There's a lot of things that it can cause your heart to turn astray, to, to stop following God. The Bible says in Psalm 60, 62, verse 10, Trust not in oppression, become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. He said, you know, if God blesses you, if for some reason you end up getting, you know, acquiring a lot of money, if your riches just increase, beware. And don't, don't let your heart get set on the riches. Keep it focused on serving God. Don't just all of a sudden say, oh, okay, now this is where my focus and my attention is going to be is on these riches. The Bible says that he that will be rich um, bring him himself snares. You know, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. When you set your heart on the things of this world, it's just going to bring you sorrow and destruction. So if your riches happen to increase, if you ever get to that point, then don't set your heart upon them. Don't worry about them. They're, they're, treat, it, treat it as it is. It's just a thing. It's a thing that's not going to be here. It's a thing that ultimately isn't that important. There's some utility to having money, like in feeding and providing for your family, but that's it. Don't, don't elevate that above the status because riches can turn your heart away from the Lord. I'll read for you from Joshua 24, 23. It says, Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. Learning about all these strange gods and these other things, these idols, can also turn away your heart from the Lord. 1 Kings 11, 4 says, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. 
King Solomon had a major downfall in that he loved many and strange women, the Bible says, that he had, you know, basically a thousand wives. He had, you know, all these concubines and wives and I mean, that's insane. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's just, that's just crazy ridiculous to have that many women in your life. And, and you can't say that you honestly love them for one. I mean, it's, that's nuts. But the Bible is very clear that his wives turned away his heart. And this is a perfect example of what I was just talking about. If you're interested in getting married one day, of seeking and finding the right person, someone who's not going to turn away your heart from the Lord. So the very first thing you have to make sure is, is this person saved? Is this person a Christian? Is this person love the Lord? That, is number, that should be number one on your list when you're trying to find somebody, when you're trying to find someone to marry. Because Solomon, that wasn't his criteria. He was marrying all kinds of strange I think he just liked variety. He, just, you know, he, he, was, he was a ruler over all Israel, and he had all this, this great time of peace and, and this, this um, you know, good relationships with all these different nations and had you know, his shipmen going to all these parts of the world, and these women were coming from all over the place, and he just liked his variety, and that's how he chose them instead of focusing on what's important and his wives ended up turning his heart away after their gods and he actually built altars under these false gods Solomon was saved he knew better than that but he let his heart get drawn away riches can draw, draw away your heart so can ungodly women the strange woman can turn your heart away after other gods you say I would never serve another god I'm sure Solomon felt the same way. Earlier on in his days when, when you know, he, God asked him and he said, I'll give you what, whatever you ask for, basically. And he just asked for wisdom. He had a real humble heart. And he wanted to do what's right. And he wanted to serve the Lord. He wanted to lead this great people and do what was right in the sight of God. That's what he cared about early on in his life. You would have asked him back then. He probably said, I'm never going to stray from serving the Lord. And then he married all these strange wives. And they did turn his heart from serving the Lord. And that was a snare unto him. We need to protect our hearts. You know, our heart already is wicked from our youth. We already got some work to do inside of our heart. When you get working on your heart, don't let, don't let all the work you've done then get destroyed because you're setting your heart on riches. You're setting your heart on a strange woman. You're setting your heart on other gods. Prepare your heart to keep you from having wicked imaginations. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles, turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Chronicles 12, 14 says, And he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. If you are not actively trying to get your heart right and to, and to set your thoughts aright and, and really work on your thought life, you're going to end up doing evil. When you don't prepare your heart to seek God, when you're not actively trying to do, hey, this is important to me, I want to serve God, and that's not a priority to you, and you're not getting your heart right, you're just going to end up doing evil because the, the thoughts of your heart at that point will just be evil and wickedness. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. So we're in a spiritual battle today. It's a war against the wicked imaginations of this world, against the wicked thoughts that are promoted in this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He's saying, our battle isn't a physical one. We're not going to get out there and, and get out our guns and start shooting. That's not our fight. It's not a carnal one. But it is a spiritual one, mighty through God, the pulling out of strongholds. Verse 5, casting down imaginations. Part of our battle is to cast down the wicked imaginations of the world, of others, of people who are promoting things out of the wickedness of their own heart. Our job is to cast that down and say that means nothing. We're going to elevate God's word. Casting out imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought 
to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, this is pretty profound. And you think about it, you know, when I was studying for this, this chapter, I was like, or for, for this sermon, that, that passage right there, I kind of read over it pretty quickly in verse 5, right near, right near the end of the verse, it says, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. Bringing it, keeping it captive, keeping your thoughts down. How is your thought life? God hates wicked imaginations. If there's one place where you could sin and think you're getting away with it, it's in your mind. It's in your thoughts because nobody else knows what you're thinking. Don't let your mind become a wicked playground to just act out all of these wicked thoughts in your head. You say, well, I'm never going to do them. But I am going to take pleasure in these wicked thoughts in my mind. We need to bring every thought into captivity. Every single one. See, the problem with having these thoughts is that you may think that it's not going to happen, but one day it probably will end up happening. The more you think about things, you're going to allow for more opportunity then because thinking won't be enough. Just like any sin, the more, the more you get involved in something, the more it's going to escalate and try to get out of control. But the Bible says that God hates wicked imaginations. How is your thought life? This is something no one else knows or no one else will probably ever know. It's between you and God. But the one thing we have to remember is that God knows everything and God does know our thoughts. We're not getting away with things when you, when you, when you come up with whatever you know, sinful thought and you, and you try to play it out in your head. God knows what you're thinking. You can't hide that from God. You can hide it from everybody else in the world, but you can't hide it from God. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 28, 9, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee, but if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. God knows all of the thoughts, all of the imaginations, all of the things that come to your mind. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 9, the thought of foolishness is sin and the scorner is abomination to men. Even just thinking a foolish thought, the Bible says, is a sin. We need to keep our thoughts. And this is, this is probably one of the hardest sermons to deal with because it has to do with our thoughts. It's easier to control your actions than it is your own thoughts. But we need to be diligent about this. The Bible says God hates the wicked imagination. He hates those wicked thoughts. Matthew 9, 4, it says, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Even Jesus Christ was able to know people's thoughts. God knows your thoughts. Always remember, don't forget that. Don't think that you're getting away with anything. Here's a thought. Matthew 5, 28, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Man, this is a very serious sin that we need to make sure that we are keeping our mind constrained, keeping every thought in subjection. Every thought in captivity is the words that we read in that other verse. That we keep that bound. Because you might say, oh, I'm just going to feast my eyes and just let imagination run wild. It's not going to hurt my wife. She'll never know about it. You're still sinning against God. Right. You're still playing out a wicked imagination in your mind that you never ought to do, ever. Job, we think about Job. Job made a covenant with his eyes to make sure that his thoughts were pure. We need to make sure that we're keeping our thoughts pure. Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes. It's a promise. He says, I made a deal with my own eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid. That's how he dealt with his thought life and, and preventing himself from committing adultery in his heart. He says, well, I just made a covenant with my eyes. Because if I'm not looking on something, I'm not going to be thinking about that. So, unfortunately, there's going to be things that cross your path 
that you have no control over. None whatsoever. That's part of being in the world. So guys, there may be a time where some woman who's dressed completely immodestly and that might be something very fleshly to look at. If you make a covenant with your eyes, you're not going to look back a second time. You're going to first just look away. Say, I'm not even going to look at that. And don't look back a second time. Amen. That's the covenant you need to make because then you say, I'm not even going to think about that. But if you're sitting there and just staring and just watching as she walks by, you're gonna, the thoughts are going to start. And some, you can't even control your thoughts sometimes. That's why you need to make the covenant with your eyes to make sure you can keep your thoughts pure. You say, well, how am I even going to think about it if I'm not looking at it? It goes beyond just the, the situation, though, where a woman's walking down the street. Because that's unintentional. What about the intentional things that get put in front of your eyes? Psalm 101, verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath a high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. The best way to keep the thoughts of your heart pure is to control what goes into your heart through your eyes and through your ears. The things that come in will impact the thoughts of your heart. What you spend your time watching, reading, the television, whatever it is, these things that come on will influence your heart and the things that you think about. When you're watching the TV and you're watching, you know, some bedroom scene or something, oh, I don't care if they show the nudity or not. When you're watching that, what is your heart thinking? What do you, what's going through your head when that's on the screen? Are you just going to indulge in that and then indulge in whatever, whatever is going on there? We need to be able to control those types of things. We need to be able to to get, and look, this is, this is one of the most difficult things, I think, in the Christian life is to be able to control your thoughts and really get, get a hold on the things that go through your mind. Amen. And it takes diligence. It, it, it takes a lot of practice. It takes memorizing Scripture so that when something comes up, you could say, you know, that, that quote from Job is great. I made a covenant with my eyes. How then shall I look upon a mate? <clears throat> think upon a mate, excuse me. God knows our thoughts, and God hates the wicked imaginations of our heart. We need to keep that in mind and remember that He knows everything, and that no matter what you may be able to hide from someone else, you can't hide it from God. So let's strive to keep the things of God in our heart. You know, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The more you're focused on, on doing what's right, getting the Scripture, you know, memorization is great for that. You're, you're, gonna, you're definitely guaranteed to keep your, your thoughts right, when you're meditating on Scripture, Amen. when that are the things that you're thinking about and focused on, um, instead of just letting your mind just wander into all kinds of whatever. Well, let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, your words. We thank you for giving us an opportunity here to be able to identify the problems that we have, dear Lord, and I pray that you please work in our, our lives individually. Lord, help us to be able to, to find the ways to make sure that we can clean up not only the outside um, appearance and, and not do or act on the things that, that are sinful, but that we could also clean the inside, which is way more important anyways, that our, that our thoughts and our hearts can be right with you and not just having wicked imaginations. Dear Lord, we know you hate that and um, we are striving to do better in your sight. Dear Lord, help us to make the changes necessary in our own lives to bring every thought into captivity. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.